The Falklands, 1982. Britain was sending a task force to reclaim the islands from Argentinian invasion. But that wasn't the only line of attack. We are going to fight for them. We're going to tell them that our boys are coming. I'm trying to demoralise the opposition who are trying to kill my friends. There was another operation designed to achieve success in the South Atlantic. And I remember him asking me um, if I was patriotic. I just said I was, yes, why not? The people involved were sworn to secrecy. So I asked him on the way what was up, and he said, I don't really know, but we've just been told to get you to London tonight. But they're speaking now for the first time. Some were convinced of failure. There are many arguments against this course, but the clincher is that it would not work. But it was given the green light from the very top. We have to recover those islands. And Margaret Thatcher looked at it and said, do it. story begins in the last place you'd expect, the French Alps. It's December 2013. I have been sent here by this man, Neil French Blake. I recorded an interview with him two months earlier. Oh, bless you, mate. Thanks very much. Let's see how many you got. Weeks or months to live. Man, it's very sad. I can't do anything about it. Um, then we maybe do just do a, sh a piece, shorter piece to camera. Sure. Well, can I not, can I then, do, can I just do this other one? Where, My name is Stuart Purvis. I'm a journalist and in 1982, I covered the Falklands War for ITN from the UK and from South America. I went on to become the editor of ITN and then a professor of journalism at City University London. While researching the war, I came across Neil French Blake and I discovered that he had an untold story. On the surface, he seems unremarkable, a reasonably successful man from a well-off family with an unusually spelt double-barrelled surname. But beyond that, not too much out of the ordinary for someone from his background. Educated at Eton, he became a BBC journalist. And then, in the 1970s, he founded a local radio station, Radio 210 in Reading. He then set himself up as a consultant on radio. But in reality, this was a cover for a deal he had done with the British Secret Intelligence Service, MI6. He would travel the world, places like the Middle East and Afghanistan, and he would report back to them on what he had seen. When I sat down with Neil French Blake, he was in poor health and agreed to an interview on the condition that we only recorded his voice. I consider myself one of the foremost experts in the world on psychological warfare because I've actually done it. Very few people have. Neil knew he was dying. He wanted his story to be told after his death. He gave me a bunch of keys and told me to travel 500 miles to an apartment he had in Valandry in the French Alps. <laughs> Here we are in Valandry, and what an amazing spot. I was to look for a filing cabinet. This is what Neil said to look for, and here it is. Okay, well, get started. There's quite a lot of documents to be looked at. The first thing I see is PSYOPS, which is the kind of military abbreviation for psychological warfare. Uh, in fact, the very, the very first thing says secret US eyes only. Documents reveal his work for British intelligence and the American CIA. A treasure trove, really, of what has actually never been published has effectively been secret. Quite extraordinary detail. I've never seen anything quite like this before. 
and after some more searching in amongst the top secret documents was evidence of what Neil French Blake did during the Falklands War. And these are scripts in Spanish here. The Falkland Islands have been a crown colony since the 1840s, but their sovereignty has always been disputed by Argentina, who called them the Malvinas. On the 2nd of April 1982, Argentina invaded. They arrived at the radio station with tapes they wanted transmitted to announce their conquest. The situation, as you might hear, is that the radio station has now been um, taken over. Um, we have three Argentine members. We have everything uh, recorded in two tapes. Yes. Okay. For the population. Well, and just a minute. If you take the gun out of my back, I'm going to transmit it to you. If you take the gun away. But I'm not speaking with the gun in my back. The British government, led by Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, swiftly dispatched a British military task force to retake the islands. There was to be no room for doubters in the ranks. Do you remember what Queen Victoria once said? Failure? The possibilities do not exist. At the same time, a top secret unit in Buckinghamshire was coming up with its own plan to help win back the Falklands. Latimer House was then the home of the British Army Psychological Warfare Unit, and they were cooking up a plan. Their special operations group called the plan Project Moonshine. The men from the ministry needed an expert to run the project, and they were tipped off by MI6 that Neil French Blake was the man for the job. confronted with a special operations group who were designed to find unconventional warfare methods to defeat the Argentinians. As my university colleague Jeff Hulbert photographed all the papers in Neil French Blake's filing cabinet, he found a secret document which lists the people who were involved in Project Moonshine. From the day we first set foot in Neil's apartment in 2013, it took us eight years to track down the people on the list. Hi, Jeff. Some had died. Some were reluctant to talk because of the Official Secrets Act. But after a lot of detective work, we finally found three people who the Ministry of Defence agreed could talk to us. A former RAF technician, but then was a civilian in 1982, Jim Warwick. Another civilian, David Addis. And Major Terence Scott of the 14th 20th King's Hussars. As the Falklands were being invaded, Major Terence Scott was just returning from a posting. I had just finished a tour commanding a squadron in a tank squadron that the regiment was in Germany at the time, and just starting at a staff job in, in this country, in England. Talk us how you got this message that you were required. Ah. I was on a course with the, in the Intelligence Corps Centre in Ashford as part of the preparation for my next job. Um, when uh, the door opened, a chap came in, muttered something quietly, to whoever was instructing us, um, and then came over to me and said, um, go pack your bag, we're off to London tonight. And uh, so I asked him on the way what was up, and he said, I don't really know, but we've just been told to get you to London tonight. So I went. Meanwhile, Neil French Blake contacted Jim Warwick. Jim was a radio engineer at Harrowwood Radio in Peterborough, but he used to work at Neil's former station, Radio 210. I got a call from Neil... French Blake, who said, um, I want you to come to London. You know, you're to come down to London now. All right. And what did you think you were going to do once you got to London? I didn't know. I didn't know. He, 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 Neil was very vague. It was something to do with studios, and that was all I knew. Did you know it was to do with the Falklands War? No, but I had a reasonable guess. At the time, David Addis was the programme controller at Radio 210 in Reading. He didn't get a call from Neil French Blake, he got a personal visit. Neil came round to my house and I remember him asking me um, if I was patriotic. A typical kind of question, um, which I said I was, yes, why not? Neil said to me, you will go to 
the managing director, Tony Stoller, and ask him for time off, and he will say yes. I don't think you think I said, is it OK? I said, I think I'm going. And he sort of looked mystified and said, OK. So I then, uh, the following day, went up um, to London with Neil, 7 o'clock in the morning. The reason the top brass was so interested in Major Scott was that he was born in Chile. His family has long-standing links there, and he was fluent in the South American version of Spanish. I was taken straight into some building, I suspect it must have been the Ministry of Defence, um, for an interview, and um, they were testing my Spanish. And uh, when I asked what it was for, they said, you don't need to know that yet, we'll tell you at the end of the interview if you pass, which apparently I did. And at this point, Terence's superiors were able to tell him and Jim and David what was behind all the cloak and dagger activities and what the psychological warfare Project Moonshine was to become. With their help, the British were going to launch a propaganda radio station that would broadcast to the Falklands in Spanish. It would be called Radio Atlantico de Sur, or Radio South Atlantic. I had chums who were down there, or on their way there, who were going to actually be doing the business. And uh, anything I could do to help and support using my Spanish, I was looking forward to it once I knew what was going to happen. This Ministry of Defence document that I found in Neil French Blake's files says that it had been established from what they call refugee debriefs, I think that means interviews with Falkland Islanders who'd escaped, that the Argentinian troops occupying the islands had got shortwave radios and were listening to foreign radio broadcasts. We also found the seven-point plan for Radio Atlantico del Sur. The top two points were his somewhat unconventional philosophy, propaganda equals truth, not lies, and truth is more powerful than lies. It was part of what he called grey propaganda. What we call grey radio stations, blacker, blacker, black, black, black and white and white. white. And the greys, you don't actually attribute yourself to anybody, but you appear to be on their side. That's what Radio Atlantic or their soul was. I'm sure this would have been in his opening meeting mm. when he would have got the whole team together mm. and explained what we were doing, why we'd all been hiked out of our various jobs uh, and brought to this um, anonymous building in the middle of London. <coughs> well, the, the, the sort of chat he gave me was, we are going to get the Falklands back. Um, we are going to make sure that these RGs don't stay there. And, you know, we are going to fight for them. And we're going to tell them that they're not going to win. And we're going to tell them that our boys are coming. The purpose of the station, as I was told it, was to get across the idea that you're going to lose this in the end because you are up against superior forces with greater knowledge and ability. Propaganda does not mean telling lies. Propaganda means imparting information that can influence the attitude of an enemy. And so French Blake devised a slogan, bringing truth to the front. Next they had to decide where to put the radio station. Well, it wasn't going to be anywhere near the South Atlantic, it was actually here in the heart of political London, Westminster. Yeah. And here was King's Buildings, a fairly anonymous looking building, where they would bring military personnel who spoke Spanish, preferably Spanish with some kind of Latin American accent. In the first week of May, this British submarine HMS Conqueror sank the Argentine cruiser the General Belgrano. The Argentinians attacked HMS Sheffield. The task force was now approaching the Falklands and a land war was imminent. The station needed to get on the air, but to the staff's frustration, the launch was delayed. In nearby Whitehall, the Ministry of Defence faced opposition from the Foreign Office over what they still called Project Moonshine. It instantly got big pushback from the Foreign Office who seemed to misunderstand the purpose of the broadcasts. Although they were made quite clear in the papers proposing the station, the Foreign Office seemed to be under the impression that it would be some sort of rival to the BBC broadcasts to Latin America. A senior Foreign Office diplomat, Nicholas Fenn, escalated the battle to Downing Street. Operation Moonshine. 
I said to the morning meeting of the emergency unit that I thought it a ludicrous notion. I strongly hope that it could be prevented. A formidable and influential figure in the government was Margaret Thatcher's press secretary, Bernard Ingham. He had strong views on Project Moonshine and let them be known in a letter to Nicholas Fenn. Dear Nick, Operation Moonshine, you can't believe it. While I suspect very much hope that it is dead, I should perhaps set out my views for the record. Even Bernard Ingham, a press man, was against this. As I understand it, the project is intended to play down-market, dirty propaganda tricks with the objective of sapping the morale of the Argentines. There are many arguments against this course, but the clincher is that it would not work. Margaret Thatcher's press secretary, Bernard Ingham, he fulminated basically against these plans. In short, there is nothing but trouble in this for Britain. We would be a lot better off if MOD put as much effort into ensuring a prompt PR response to South Atlantic events as it apparently puts into dreaming up moonshine. Yours sincerely, Bernard Ingham. <laughs> On the 18th of May 1982, the Defence Secretary John Knott left the Ministry of Defence and walked over here to Number 10 Downing Street for a crunch meeting of the War Cabinet. It would probably be his last chance to get his radio station on the air. Coming the other way down Whitehall from the Foreign Office was the Foreign Secretary Francis Pym. And his brief from his civil servants was simple, kill Operation Moonshine. Chairing the War Cabinet was the Prime Minister herself, Margaret Thatcher, and her strong supporter Cecil Parkinson. Whichever way they decided would affect the fate of the radio station. Argentina has invaded the Falklands. Britain is throwing everything it can at the South Atlantic to get them back. MI6 recommends Neil French Blake as the best man to assemble a propaganda radio station. The plan is to broadcast to the occupying troops to help tip the balance. The Ministry of Defence is all for it. The Foreign Office is against it. The plan comes before a War Cabinet meeting chaired by Margaret Thatcher. And we know all this because these are the minutes of the meeting and they tell an interesting story. The main business of the War Cabinet was to decide whether to land British troops on the Falklands and fight a land war, and they made that decision. That decision having been made, they moved on to the radio station, and they looked at it in the context of the landing, and they decided that the radio station could have a valuable psychological effect on the garrison and could therefore save British lives. They gave the go-ahead for Radio Atlantico. Margaret Thatcher looked at it and said, do it. While the top civil servants had been arguing, engineer Jim Warwick had been talking to Neil about how to get the station on the air. OK, you realise that uh, the Falklands is a long way away and it's over water and there's no bits of wire between here and there. And he said, yes, that's been sorted. Oh, OK, fine. So apparently they've been on to BT, who set up links to uh, a link to Ascension Island and then that was where the transmitters were and they set up the link to Ascension Island which was a short wave link and it was rubbish but they also had given us a phone a direct phone link to Ascension Island and that was lovely so I first thing I did after we started was switch the, the feed to the, the transmitter to the using the phone line because it was a far better signal and uh, off we went <laughs> That is it. That's the jingle. On the 19th of May 1982, the very first programme of Radio Atlantical de Sur was sent from the studios in this building in Westminster towards Ascension Island, where it was then put on a transmitter requisitioned from the BBC, and that sent it onwards towards the Falklands and towards Argentina. And that is how a Royal Navy Lieutenant and an RAF squadron leader Sounded like this. Oye, José Miguel, ¿qué tenemos esta noche? Bien, para esta noche tenemos las noticias. Los discos. Las crónicas. Las dedicaciones. Y las pausas sentimentales. Y los astros. 
I certainly remember watching the start of the broadcast and we were able to listen in to the repeater station on Ascension Island so we knew that it was being broadcast, we knew it was going out and that was quite a feeling. Was there applause or cheers in the newsroom? This is Britain. <laughs> There was music interwoven in that and messages uh, about uh, people and I think, was there even a recipe in there somewhere? I mean, there was an idea of, of it being a sort of a, a gentle Radio 2 idea, something they'd like to listen to. But Neil needed someone to give him advice on Argentinian music and one British man seemed the obvious choice, who only five years previously had a massive hit by writing the line Don't cry for me, Argentina. I ran up to Tim Rice to ask him for advice on Argentinian music. <laughs> and then, the Evita man. Then, Evita, yeah, yeah, he's a friend of mine. Is he? Yeah. It was very clear that the aim was never to try and persuade Argentine forces of the merits of the British claim to sovereignty or anything political or diplomatic. It, it, it had purely two aims. The first was to persuade Argentine troops to hesitate before firing on British forces. The second one was to persuade Argentine forces of the merits of surrender. Soon the station would be put to the test. On only its second day of transmission, British troops got ready to land and begin the battle. Radio Atlantico made clear the peace talks were going nowhere. Las noticias. La primer ministra inglesa, la señora Thatcher, ha dejado a los parlamentarios sin duda alguna que la solución militar es la única opción que existe para solucionar la crisis de las Malvinas. The station was live on air for three hours each night and later with an added breakfast program. It was a mix of news, music and features, all with a nuanced psychological aim. And it started just in time. The following morning, British troops landed in the Falklands. Radio Atlantica was ready to bring the occupiers of the Falklands what was good news for Britain, but bad news for them. Nobody was sort of standing on my shoulder saying, you should write this or not write that. And it just didn't seem correct, if you like, to report on British losses because that wasn't our role. They were very selective in their news, but there was actually, the instruction was actually very clear um, from, from Neil French Blake, um, no lies must be told. So e every, everything um, was truthful. Of course, it was selective truth. What your role was to what, tell the good news about yes. how the war was going. Yeah, exactly. But not the bad news. Yeah. As the land war started, there were also military updates presented by announcers with Argentine sounding names, according to scripts I found in Neil French Blake's secret archive. The station's military pundit was called Jaime Montero. That's it, Jaime Montero. Jaime Montero. That who, was my who, name. Is, who is Jaime Montero? I was Jaime you Montero. You are Jaime Montero. En cambio, no se ha explicado cómo los aviones Sicaria han podido seguir operando tan efectivamente de esta nave supuestamente tan mal abriada. And so despite the fact that he was a broadcasting amateur and had zero experience in front of a broadcast microphone, Major Terence Scott, of the 14th 20th King's Hussars, a.k.a. Jaime Montero, hit the airwaves of the South Atlantic. Terence would seize any opportunity to unnerve young Argentine conscripts. Los Gurkhas. Ah, uh, see. Sí. Now, tell us about what you would like the average Argentine conscript on the Falklands to know about the Gurkhas. We sent down the Queen Elizabeth um, after the um, Canberra, etc., after the initial task force had gone. In the QE2 came the Gurkhas. I thought this was a perfect opportunity to create a little uncertainty in the locals' minds. One of the foibles about the Gurkhas is their use of the cookery. So the cookery was this sort of giant knife, yes. effectively. Which they would take a sheep's head off at one blow. Yeah. 
El Kukri tiene que vertir sangre. I think we did a story about how fierce the Gurkhas were. You don't want to mess with the Gurkhas. Something of those lines. He came round to the Gurkhas. He said, well, we will emphasise the Kukri, the Gurkha knife and all the little stories about the Gurkhas and all the rest of it, you know, just to try and terrify the buggers. It's not untrue, but I'm trying to demoralise the opposition who are trying to kill my friends. I was trying to get them to surrender. It might save their life as well as my friends. Do you think your station did had any effect on morale? That yes, I do. You do? Absolutely, because they were conscripts. Yeah. They weren't professional soldiers. Of course, it was very important to make the Argentine troops listen by giving them what they wanted to hear. And many wanted to hear the latest football results from back home and how their hero Maradona was getting on. So the station had an audaciously simple plan to get that information. We had all the telephone books, so we just rang up the press box in the stadium <laughs> about two minutes before the game was due to end and said to them, hey, what's the score at the moment, mate? Oh, thank you very much. We try and keep them talking for the last two minutes. I'd see. Instead. But the moment the whistle went, bang, bang, we had the score out ahead of every single Argentinian station. Since I'd managed to track down three of the staff of Radio Atlantico, I thought it would be a good idea to arrange a reunion. After all, they haven't seen each other for 40 years. As the British task force steamed towards the Falklands, the Ministry of Defence put a propaganda radio station on the air in the South Atlantic. Spanish-speaking officers tried to convince the occupying troops not to fire on the British and to seriously consider surrender. I've tracked down three staff members of the station and are reuniting them after 40 years. Some former colleagues, David Addis, who was the news editor, and Jim Warwick, who was the station engineer. So you were the one that made it work. <laughs> That's right. It looks as though things may have changed since you were last here. There's lots of sort of white boards. Yeah. Anything There's that strikes you? Staircase. No staircase. No staircase, all right. Yeah. Yeah. The windows were right up to the ceiling. Oh, I see, yes, yes. of course. They've dropped, the ceiling, they've dropped yeah. the ceiling, haven't they? Yeah. Yeah, oh, that's it's, what... It's much more like a sort of preparatory school, wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Actually, the way it was run, too, with... <laughs> that's true. <laughs> with, with Commander Neil running the whole thing. Yeah. It's like home, right? <laughs> the thing I remember particularly closely is it was a good feeling of, t of teamwork, of, of working mm. together, yes, of comradeship. Now, yeah. I spent 13 years in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. This was the first time we did anything <laughs> the radio station would try to increase the sense of isolation for the Argentinian soldiers who listened. It had a homely feel and played their favourite pop music, sourced at nearby HMV Oxford Street. Radio Atlantico de Sur even had a soap opera, Los Viejos, the Old Men. Two characters, Pablo and Pancho, chewed the fat about the world as they saw it. I found recordings and one of Neil French Blake's scripts for the old men in his archives. In one scene of the soap opera, the old men discussed the latest worrying news for the Argentinian troops occupying the islands and talked up the advantage of surrendering. It is a sad tale, I must say, and it merely confirms that the poor soldiers in the trenches around Port Stanley are in for a hell of a time when the full march on Port Stanley is unleashed. Certainly if I were there, I would surrender at the first opportunity because I value my life. Within a week of landing, the British achieved victory at Goose Green and took enemy troops prisoner. With an idea borrowed from World War II, the names of prisoners of war who were alive and well were read out. It could encourage more to surrender and perhaps persuade their families on the homeland to push for peace. I'm sure that we had an effect. It's never going to be measurable. Um, 
and who would have been most affected will always be questionable. Uh, I suspect that one of the lasting effects we had was that the families um, of the soldiers who deployed there will have um, heard of what we were doing, what we were saying, found it to have been true. When we gave out the names of those who had been taken prisoner and that were therefore safe, they would have been relieved to know that that was uh, that so, and that would be good work as far as they were concerned. Curiously, the Ministry of Defence at the time never actually tried to find out whether anybody in the target audience had ever listened to Radio Atlantico. For instance, they never interviewed any of the many Argentinian prisoners of war. So 40 years on, I decided to try and find out. I'm going to Buenos Aires to see what an Argentinian veteran thought of Britain's Radio Atlantico del Sur. Patria, sí, colonia, no! In Argentina, the memories are still raw of the battle for what they and Radio Atlantico called the Malvinas. There's a memorial to the conflict in the heart of the capital, Buenos Aires. I met up with an Argentinian veteran to find out what it was like for the listeners of Radio Atlantico del Sur. Did they like the music? Han gustado la música. Sí, sí, obvio. Sí, nosotros este nos gustaba porque nosotros éramos jóvenes y para nosotros este lo Los británicos, los conjuntos, este, sobre todo los Beatles, era, fuimos una generación, en algunos casos, que nació con ellos este cambio. Por lo tanto, se, anticipi, se anticipa que los esfuerzos de aviones Haria operarán desde los portaaviones Invencible y Hermes, los cuales en estos momentos deben de estar transportando el número máximo posible de aviones. Y nosotros sabíamos que era parte de la propaganda y en general Este, pasaban música y pasaban este, estos anuncios de entregarse a los soldados. No, no, nuestra suposición es que esto estaba hecho desde la isla Ascensión, eh, porque era la base de, de reaprovisionamiento británico que habían permitido los americanos este, habilitar ahí. The fact that Terence Scott was born and raised in Chile was a godsend to Radio Atlantico del Sur, helping them to sound as authentic as possible. But his extended family also helped. Major Tony Valdez Scott was Terence's cousin. He also grew up in Chile and ended up in the same regiment as Terence. He became the editor of the station. Sadly, he died in 2021. And there was another cousin with a Chilean background who did her bit by becoming the only female voice on the station. She was the chief announcer and was known as Mariana Flores. Her tones like that of a mother, wife or girlfriend were designed to add to the troops' homesickness. I played Terence a recording of Mariana delivering one of her pausa sentimentale, a sentimental pause. Tell me you wouldn't be moved by that. <laughs> the novice military broadcasters continued when the British flagship, the aircraft carrier HMS Hermes, arrived near the Falklands with reinforcements, aircraft and helicopters, it was down to Major Terence Scott's alter ego, Jaime Montero, to deliver the news to the Argentinian troops. Jaime Montero. Soy Muy buenas noches. ¿Cómo estás tú? Y creo que tienes la situación militar para nosotros. Sí, lo tengo aquí. La moral de las tropas de la agrupación táctica ha aumentado considerablemente con la reciente llegada de los demás aviones Haria. Ha comunicado el reportero de la aso asociación de prensa, Martin Cliva, el cual está a bordo del portaavión Hermes. Estos refuerzos han casi duplicado la cantidad de esos aviones de gran eficacia a bordo del grupo táctico. 
e incluyen la versión especial para combate aire a tierra, el cual será un arma potente en cualquier atentado para reocupar las islas. Muchísimas gracias a Jaime y aquí tenemos una dedicación. Very exciting. I mean, appallingly dumb. <laughs> But very exciting what? hearing what they would have heard. Back in the French Alps, I had discovered more about what was in Neil's archive. This is, this is really interesting. This Principles of Psychological Warfare, beginning in the Falklands in 1982. This looks to have been written by Neil himself. An extraordinary, what kind of music to use. Um, training manuals, just kind of how to run a psychological war, I guess. And one way to run a psychological war is to turn around true news stories to your advantage. One of their broadcasts was based on rumors of Argentinian troops eating local sheep amidst an outbreak of liver fluke, which causes serious diseases. So we gave them long enough to make sure that um, enough would have eaten it before we warned them of the dangers of liver fluke. And we then went into some considerable detail, I remember, because I, I particularly enjoy doing that sort of thing, I'm afraid, um, of uh, the awful symptoms of this disease, and certainly if they'd eaten any of this, they should certainly report sick. David, that brought back <laughs> memories for you as well, well did you? absolutely. I remember exactly the same story. You know, we worked on it together, and I remember writing it up as well, in exactly mm. that angle mm. of, you know, mm. be careful because, you know, don't go around butchering sheep because, ha ha, you could get all sorts of nasty things. Yeah. Sheep really could well. Oh, yeah. exactly. Yeah. You don't have to say too much, you've just got to sow the seed. And these people were there to kill, you know, our people, our men, my friends. Mm and they were in defensive positions, and our people were going to have to attack them over open ground. So I felt no inhibitions about um, undermining their morale. If it saved any of our people, I'd be delighted. Cheers. And the station would sometimes direct their programming towards the Argentinian mainland, not just the Falklands. Ahora deseo mandar una poesía de mi parte, o digamos de parte de todas las mujeres argentinas que lamentan estar sin maridos, hijos o novios. Ay, qué trabajo me cuesta quererte como te quiero. Por tu amor me duele el aire, el corazón y el sombrero. ¿Quién me compraría a mí este cintillo que tengo y esta tristeza de hilo blanco para hacer pañuelos? Ay, qué trabajo me cuesta que quererte como te quiero. I remember particularly that um, we had some sort of competition where a dinner, a candlelit dinner with Mariana Flores, was the, um, after all this awful business of fighting is over, a candlelit dinner with Mariana Flores was the, the, the prize. I don't know that it ever happened, but perhaps there was no response. <laughs> exactly. Neil French Blake wanted to do anything he could to tip the balance of the hostilities, but sometimes his ideas were a little too extreme for his bosses. For example, what he planned to do with a list of Argentinian casualties. Well, I had a plan, and that was we could ring up quite easily the barracks of the soldiers that had been killed and ask for their nearest of kin's address and then ring them up and have them on air, live on air, telling them that I'm sorry to tell you your son's been killed and get their reaction. But they thought that was going a bit too far, so they wouldn't let me do that. Right. During the Falklands War, the Ministry of Defence set up a Spanish-speaking radio station to broadcast propaganda to the occupying troops. 971, Radio Atlántico del Sur. In the early days of the Falklands War, I used to go to the Ministry of Defence for media briefings. What I didn't realise at the time was that the Ministry was planning its own media, its own radio station, transmitting in Spanish, beamed at the occupying troops. And I now have the staff list of the people who worked on that radio station. Some of the names have not yet been released. Uh, there are seven civilians, and, and some of them had done some radio work, but everybody else is from the three military services. 
and none of them had ever worked on a radio station before. I read somewhere that it, that it was decided that nobody would be named by their rank, they would, everyone would be known by their Christian name. Is that right? Certainly I had no idea what the rank was, except for one chap who was a Jaguar pilot. Right. Yes. Um, so you weren't Major Scott, no, you no. were just Terence. Yes. yes. And you were just David. Absolutely. Yeah. So to that extent, uh, if you didn't know somebody's background, you didn't actually know who was military and who was civilian. Yeah. Is that well, right? You did. You looked you... at the hair. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. That's true. And so the broadcasts continued as Terence, Jim, David, and the rest of the Radio Atlantic Elder Sur team did their bit, using psychological warfare to do what they could to support the task force in the South Atlantic. But then the news was declared. I've just heard that the white flag is flying over Sandy. Oh! Marvellous forces, every single one of them. It's just been everyone together. And that's what matters. We knew what we had to do. On the 14th of June, after losing a series of key battles, the Argentinian garrison surrendered. The next day, after 47 broadcasts, Radio Atlantic El de Sur was unceremoniously closed down. The moment the um, ceasefire and surrender came on, uh, we were realised that that was our job was over. And in a remarkably short time, in an hour or so, I mean, I remember the whole thing was being packed up, gone, uh, and within must have been a day, I suspect, the whole. The, the offices were cleared, you know, no trace. It was incredible how quickly it happened. You know, we, we heard about the surrender and we got ourselves all ready to do a, you know, a programme on the end of it. And suddenly we weren't on air anymore. Basically, it was as simple as that. There was a feeling of euphoria, that sort of end of school term feeling, but at the same time a feeling of, hmm, is that it? <laughs> Somebody has said, right, it's all over. Um, pack your bags, don't forget to pay your bills, any barbell, etc. in the club before you go. The colonel came in and said, that's it, guys. We're off. BBC want their transmitter back. The senior civil servant at the Ministry of Defence thanked Neil French Blake for his team's hard work. It had been a memorable enterprise, he wrote. They all went back to their previous jobs and never returned. Neil French Blake later would run clandestine radio stations for the CIA in Southeast Asia. Using a similar model of news in a local language plus popular music, he had some success encouraging resistance to Vietnam's occupation of Cambodia. But he was fired by the CIA for going public about the operation. He ended up writing a book about the golf courses of Southeast Asia. He died in 2015. After the war, they said the total cost was £40,000. You maybe have to multiply that by as much as four times to come to a figure for today. You know, you're aiming at behavioural effect, not attitude. You're not trying to persuade them that Britain was right. Consider if, for example, it did persuade one Argentine soldier to not fire on one British soldier. It's absolutely worth it. Their only thank yous, a souvenir sweatshirt and T-shirt. In pretty good order. Wow. I'm impressed. I don't think I had to. <laughs> <laughs> Feeling of a, of a job well done, Jim? I think we did a very good job. We got the programme out, we got them sent to attention, transmitted, yeah. Yeah. and in the best quality we could do in those days. My father was uh, Royal Navy Volunteer Reserve. I was never tempted to go into the services myself, but I can't help thinking slightly I was doing it for him as well. No, I was very pleased, and I did the job well done. Now, listening to one or two of those recordings, I regret I didn't have a second chance to do them right. Well, some of us involved in broadcasting for many years with well, exactly what you mean, exactly. <laughs> and with that, the Radio Atlantico veterans set off for the pub round the corner a favourite haunt at the time. 40 years on, Terence, David and Jim have finally been able to tell their story for the first time on behalf of all their colleagues. 
But during those years, the Ministry of Defence has repeated the same Radio Atlantico formula in conflicts as recently as Afghanistan. Well, maybe one day we'll find out more about that. But just for today, the toast inside is definitely to Radio Atlantico de Sul. We need a toast. We need a toast. Those who did the fighting, well, we had the easy job. Radio Atlantico de Sul and absent friends. Here we are.